Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the last lecture, we have uh, uh, given the general overview of the uh, the supply chain ecosystem <coughs> and the framework. And uh, as uh, we saw, the uh, the ecosystem has four elements: it is the supply chain, the resources, the institutions, and the delivery and service mechanisms. What we are going to do in the next uh, uh, for lectures is to take each one of these and study these in detail as a part of the supply chain ecosystem. What is that you need to do? Uh, study in terms of the supply chain, in terms of the resources, institutions and delivery mechanisms. So after these four lectures, you will have a, a, an idea of what the supply chain ecosystem is and how to proceed with both analysis and design. <coughs> So, in terms of the contents, uh, we will present the ecosystem and then we will talk about uh, uh, the global supply chains and also we we'll take two examples and uh, one are the electronics and another one is the apparel and look at what are the various types of contract manufacturing firms that have evolved because of uh, the globalization of the manufacturing supply chains. And <coughs> finally, we look at uh, modular organizations. As we say, as I told you before, that this so-called globalization, so-called globalization is because of modularization of the products. Instead of making an integral product, you make modular products. And you have modular products, modular processes. So, is it possible to have organization structures which are modular? That's what we will we will look at, and finally conclude this lecture. So, if you want to look at uh, the four forces, uh, that is the supply chain, delivery service mechanisms, institutions, and resources, we'll first study the global supply chains. Now, modularity in both products and processes. So, we have product. Any product behind every supply chain, there is a product or the behind every product there is a supply chain. Our supply chain is produces these products and the modular product is made by appropriately combining different modules. Instead of making one individual module, you have the various electronic items uh, uh, to which you combine into a make into a PC or you make into a laptop or a cell phone and so on. And it provides the customers a number of options for each module and thus the product. In other words, what happens is you can change the product specifications. I mean the product remains the same. A PC is a PC, but you can change its processor, you can change its memory size and other kinds of things and according to the customer options. And products differ from each other in terms of the subsets of modules assembled to produce them. So basically, it's not the product is the same, but the subsets uh, of the modules that are used to assemble to produce them is different. So, and similarly, like a modular product, you have modular processes. Each module undergoes a specific set of operations, making it possible to outsource manufacturing and inventory them in semi-finished form. If you if you make a, 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 an automobile, you have an assembly like a door or, a, or an engine or something and that is a sub-assembly and the process on which this is manufactured, the module is manufactured, is a modular process and that is standardized and which is standardized means the equipment that is needed to manufacture that particular sub-assembly is standard and the process and the designs, everything is standardized. So since because of the standardization, you will be able to outsource both the, the sub-assembly and uh, 
people can buy some equipment from some manufacturers and use the standard designs and standardized processes to manufacture sub assemblies and sell them to big uh, original equipment manufacturers. So, if you look at uh, modular products and modular processes, you have modular organization structures. We will have a chance to uh, look at uh, uh, the modular organization structures before the end of this lecture. So, we have various supply chain uh, trends like modularity and outsourcing. So, we have modular products which means standardized production processes and outsourcing led to modular supply chains. So, you have the modular products, so which are sub assemblies, which are tire 1, and tire 1 outsources its particular components to tire 2, tire 3, and so on. And this, the products are standard, the components which are manufactured follow the standardized production processes, and hence they are outsourced to low cost countries. And if you combine all this, like I have shown in the first lecture, a multi tier supply chain diagram, it becomes a modular supply chain. <coughs> and standardized component manufacturers have become IP monopolies and feel global market power. Now, what happens in a product? If you take a PC, you can assemble a PC, buy various kinds of components, assemble a PC in your house. So, and similarly, it is possible to, to hire a, a wooden table <coughs> or, or something, whatever this one. So, but then the intellectual property will be in the, uh, in the hands of the component manufacturers. For example, Intel chips, Windows, operating, Windows operating system, auto components, auto engines. These are all the monopoly is, is uh, the IP intellectual property is in these components. But anybody can take this particular components from, buy it from their market and they can assemble them into a particular product. Products have thus become commodities with the availability of codifiable and easily replicable knowledge about assembling the final product. So, that is what I have been saying. You can assemble the final product by buying the components in your house. So, the strategic competitive advantage for assemblers, for example, Dell, General Motors, Nokia and others moves from the factory to managing the global supply chain and social capital with the stakeholders. So, where is your competitive advantage? Why to, Why should I buy from Dell? Or why should I buy from a car from GM or Marty or whatever? So, the, the strategic advantage becomes or the brand for these manufacturers comes in managing the global supply chain. And also the social capital with the stakeholders, which actually means that the intellectual property for any particular product lies A in the tail end that is the components and B in managing the entire supply chain by the assemblers and also the connections that the global supply chain assembler or supply chain global supply chain owner or the OEM has with its stakeholders. So, you can see the change that has happened over the last 10 decades from 1913 when Henry Ford has started a vertically integrated enterprise to a globally dispersed manufacturing system. Today, the competitive advantage has moved from the one ownership of all the facilities to the managing the global supply chain or making the components the vital components that are needed for the particular products. So, if you look at uh, uh, an iPad, uh, China assembles all iPods, but it gets only four dollars of unit and just over one percent of US retail price of 300. You sell this for 300 or 299 in the US and you say you have outsourced this to China 
and China gets only 4 percent. So, the largest share of the value in the iPod goes to the enterprises in the US, 163 dollars of the iPads 299 retail value, it goes 75 for distribution and retail, 80 dollars to Apple and 8 dollars to domestic component manufacturers. So, you can see how uh, the how low cost has become how much profit the US manufacturers can make from this particular diagram. So, what are the types of standardization here that are required? One is the standardization of parts. Common parts are used across many processes, products redesigned as necessary. So, basically you can you can have uh, the products you can use you know uh, the the particular product like a PC or a cell phone. The memory can be can be different. It can be 8 GB or it can be 16 GB, 32 GB, and the cost varies based on that. And the memory strip can be can be fixed depending on that. So what happens is they the, the strips out of the same size, but the memory capacity changes. So common parts are used across many processes and products are redesigned if necessary. And process standardization, standardizing as much of the processes as possible, making a generic or a family product. So, if you standardize the processes, then it is easier to outsource. And also, by standardizing they are this one, you can easily automate the particular process using IT and other technologies. And the final product assembly is delayed until the customer order is received. It is called postponement. In other words, the final assembly, for example, if you order a, a laptop from Dell, they will wait until you have paid the money, they get the cash and then they will assemble the particular product and deliver it to you within 24 or 48 hours or whatever it may be. So, this is called postponement and the process and product standardization, modularization help in in making this possible. So, if you look at uh, the integrated product value chain modularity, they are integrated products that means the OEM original equipment manufacturer manufactures the product and if there are screws and other things to be fixed and they fix it, fix them, but it is an integrated design. And the next level we can have you can make the product into three modules. So, module 1, module 2, module 3 they are all made by the OEM, but it is a modular product, but they are assembled by the OEM himself. And the third stage is that you have 1 and 2 modules 1 and 2 are made outside and you have module 1 and you have you make it as a modular assembly by the still at the OEM, but now you can outsource supplier module 2 to a supplier and module 3 to as another supplier and make module 1 out of this. So, you are basically making a modular uh, value chain by outsourcing and designing your supply chain properly. So, this is the effect of uh, uh, the outsourcing is the effect of modularization is shown in this diagram clearly. Now, if you look, want to look at some examples like uh, automobile, for example, auto has the car has uh, different uh, 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 modules. For example, there is the roof, there is the uh, deck lid, there is the rear end, uh, and there are the doors, there are the seats, wheels, the front end, the powertrain, the cockpit, and the hood. Now, each of these are manufactured by different manufacturers of course, you should not forget the tires. Now, the dashboard for example, if we take the dashboard module, it has also several components. So, each of these modules are, ma are manufactured in different by different suppliers and you have also the dashboard module for example, is done and it is assembled as a dashboard and supplied here. So, the the product modularity, you can see it very clearly in this diagram that automobile has maybe uh, 5000 different parts and maybe about uh, 100 different assemblies. So, you, 
you can see how many different manufacturers an automobile manufacturer has to has to deal with in this. Now, what about process modularity? Supposing you take the uh, the assembly line of uh, the car here. So, in the assembly line, for example, the car comes, they put the cockpit pre-assembly here, and afterwards it goes here, and then they put all the electrical pre-assembly here, and the powertrain assembly in N, and they put all the gears and all this here and the doors pre-assembly here and pre-assembly of the front end, the wheels and seats and finally the car goes out. So, you can see that uh, here the each of these modules have made the process modular and because the process and by which you manufacture these are standardized and they produce the same components with the same specifications. When they put the cockpit assembly here, it exactly fits. And similarly for all this. So, when as depending on the number of components that you have, it becomes mandatory that you make your assembly to specifications so that the the final product does not has is not a loose assembly, but it is a tight assembly of various kinds of parts and so on. So here, it's it's very, very these two diagrams, the product and process modularity diagrams for automobile, this basically shows uh, both the product modularity as well as the process manufacturing. So if you look at uh, the manufacturing firms uh, in uh, uh, in electronics. Let us look at the electronics and then uh, you have uh, the, the electronics have what are called EMS firms. Uh, the, uh, uh, they are basically electronic manufacturing services or set of companies that design, test, manufacture, distribute and provide uh, return and repair services for electronic OEMs. Now, here EMS firms grow through increased scope and scale. Now, how does, how do, the, how did this electronic manufacturing service or contract manufacturing services like Factortronics, Solitron and other things have come? Because the OEMs earlier of electronic OEMs like IBM and, uh, and, and others, they were making losses because they were manufacturing products only for themselves and they did not have enough scale to make profits. And similarly, the electronics has a lot of scope, a lot of variety of products and so EMS firms uh, they basically there is a lot of scope and so they were not able to manufacture all this, uh, they have, the manufacturing processes do not have the flexibility in all this. So what, uh, what the, these people did, the OEMs did was they have outsourced this uh, uh, their manufacturing to contract manufacturers or electronic manufacturing services, these firms. And the other things that uh, the EMS has, EMS have is they have acquisitions of underutilized manufacturing assets of the OEMs and also SMEs in manufacturing and product design. So, the EMS firms have grown in the 80s and 90s. Uh, through acquisitions of the underutilized manufacturing assets of the OEMs and also from the SMs and they have thrived by the increased outsourcing of the OEMs. So, there are three kinds of uh, electronic firms. One is CM which stands for contract manufacturer, the ODM original design manufacturing, CDM contract design manufacturing are the three popular EMS segments. Let us see each of them. The contract manufacturing, they does manufacturing, packaging, design supplied by the OEM. So, it is very clear that the, the designs are supplied by the original equipment manufacturer and the contract manufacturer does the manufacturing and packaging and supplies it to the OEM. The component suppliers are specified by the OEM. In other words, the orders for the components from tire 1, tire 2 and other suppliers is all done by OEM. So, it means only the, the uh, manufacturing and packaging 
are the two activities that are done by the contract manufacturing. One should understand that the manufacturing and packaging these are asset intensive and commoditized activities it because these are these are well known activities and anybody can do it and so what happens here is these contract manufacturers usually suffer uh, from commoditization of their products as well as the once the, the the equipment is asset intensive you have to replace the equipment and you have to basically uh, 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 you have to basically replace as well as modernize your equipment and train your own staff and all that. All that takes a lot of time and money. So the other one is contract design and manufacturing which is CDM. That is you do the contract manufacturing work which is manufacturing and packaging. You do the product design also. You do the supply chain management and you do the logistics. You do the engineering services. What are the engineering services? The engineering services of uh, like packaging or transportation, uh, uh, finding the financiers and so on. And IP per design is still with the OEM. So here the intellectual property is still with the OEM. So the design is supplied by the OEM. The rest of it is done by uh, the the contract design manufacturing unit and so does design changes resulting in higher margins. Uh, so to improve manufacturability based on experience of producing similar products for several OEMs. So what happens is in the CDM gains a lot because usually these contract manufacturers they work for several OEMs. If you are taking a cell phone, they work for Nokia, they work for Motorola, they work for uh, Sony and lot of other companies. So when they work for those, those kind of companies, the same product, there is a similarity in terms of producing similar, there is, there is similarity in terms of the products, in terms of their uh, manufacturing capabilities as well as also the components. Everybody uses the same, uh, the same hood, everybody uses the same processor and so on, same memory size and all that. So what the CDM can do is to improve the manufacturability based on the experience of producing products for several different people. And savings in sourcing and logistics by using the same components for products of different OEMs. In other words, if you have say doing this for five different manufacturers, you are producing a cell phone of different brands. So by sourcing the components by from the same supplier, you can get more discounts. By so sourcing this from the same supplier, same place, either in China or India or whatever. So you can transport all this by because of the scale, you get save in logistics costs. So the contract design manufacturing has uh, thrived, uh, you know, by uh, Flexotronics and others because of they were able to get the scale, scale and scope by working with different manufacturers here. So, but the IP design is still with the OEM. So, what is happening here is the contract manufacturers can be a risk factor for the original equipment manufacturer. When you are giving your design and you are depending on the manufacturer for all manufacturing and everything else on the CDM, then you are hollowing out your capabilities. So the OEM suffers a risk unless they are careful. So that we will, we will study a bit later. And the original design and manufacturing ODM original design and manufacturing here ODM initiates design manufacturing IP and licensing etc and shop for owner in other words the uh, earlier there is an OEM who is giving you the contract now that all changes you are basically doing everything you are producing a cell phone of your brand and then 
in other words you produce a cell phone and go to nokia hey i have a cell phone it is of the brand here and i can give it to you for this particular price do you want to label it as yours so if they agree they they develop unbranded products and sell them and can alter product design for manufacturability and cost they are co-located their design and manufacturing facilities to gain cost advantage and subcontract some of the activities to contract manufacturers so this is what happens supposing some big retailers like walmart or or anybody so they can basically have their own brand like with this original design equipment manufacturing company can create walmart cell phones or have their design walmart need not have to do anything except it's, it's give us name and then it will be sell on walmart this one so there are several products which are coming out and this is what is happening in the electronic designs so but then there are risks involved in each of them in contract manufacturing it is need to man manage manufacturing risks only in other words the the design is supplied by the oem and the marketing is done by the oem and you need to manage only your manufacturing risk in other words your sourcing everything the suppliers suppliers are all selected by the oem so you are just doing the manufacturing so if there are any defects in your manufacturing processes if you are there failure of your machines or something and because of that the product has has some defects then you get into problems otherwise you don't have any other risks associated with this if you are cdm then in addition to manufacturing the design may need modifications adding overseeing costs so in other words when you are when somebody gives you the, the this one and you may manufacture the product design and all that then the uh, then uh, you have you have to basically co collaborate and coordinate everything and there are some oversight costs and the oem bears the market risk and in the case of odm then both technical and market risk are borne by the ems firm hence more responsibility so you require extensive market analysis and development of product architecture future risk may come in the form of constant upgradation of design expertise and manufacturing capabilities we have seen particularly in electronics how things are changing it was from pc to laptop to tablet to cell phones so the, there is a tremendous amount of technology change so you will have those risks and needs inter organizational coordination as i said earlier if you are a oem and you have you have connections with with uh, all your suppliers and other stakeholders and but if you are uh, in the odm without any kind of a brand then it may be uh, you need intra organizational coordination uh, to make your uh, your things happen so there are risks involved in all the three segments so if you look at uh, the manufacturing uh, firms in the apparel industry you have uh, for example uh, the assembler or cmt cut make and trim or the uh, the manufacturer for the first first type of manufacturing and the contract manufacturer designs the and fabric or designs and fabrics are supplied by the customer manufacturer customer manufacturer cuts and sews the fabric into the garments so here the 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 fabric and the designs are supplied by the customer like whoever whoever it is it can be reebok it can be polo uh, it can be walmart it can be anybody and the manufacturer cuts and sews the fabric into garments like that's the design so it does the the contract manufacturing work so original equipment manufacturing is customer provides the design and specifies the raw materials in other words customer says this is a sweater uh, it's, it has to be made of this kind of wool and oem sources and finance the fabric provide all the production and packaging services for delivery to the retail outlet so basically that's what the oems uh, oems do so they have more responsibility here 
and original design manufacturing in apparel is to organize and coordinate design of products, selection, purchasing of materials, all stages of production such as cutting, sewing, trimming, packaging and delivery of the finished product to the customer. So, you have various types of apparel firms like uh, in the case of uh, the electronics, you have the same kind of thing in the apparel firms. So, we have uh, seen so far that uh, in the uh, electronics and apparel sections, there are three kinds of organizations that is the contract uh, manufacturing, original design manufacturing and uh, and so on and similarly in the apparels. So, but then what about other verticals? You know, if we take auto vertical, is it possible to distribute it like this? But auto is a typical uh, uh, this one where the globalization has not to happen. What happened was only regionalization. Rather, that's where horizontal uh, outsourcing or horizontal uh, integration has happened in the auto industry. What is horizontal integration? If you have a, a company like uh, General Motors or uh, Hyundai or somebody, they will come to India or they will go to China and set up their own factories there and they will source local components. Why? That's because the auto components are more expensive and C and two, they are regional. In other words, the auto, the driving speeds and depend on the infrastructure, the roads, the quality of the roads and, and all that and also the left hand, right hand drive and these kind of things and if you have auto steering or uh, you know uh, switching of the gears and all that depends on the driving habits of the people. It also depends on the infrastructure and the also the part heaviness makes it it, it has to be delivered via ships and it cannot be airlifted. So, because of all these reasons, auto uh, uh, supply chain is more regional than global. But on the other hand, in the apparel as well as the electronic sections, it has become more global. So, once you have products which are modular, and then the processes which are modular, is what is what about next? What is an organization? Organization is the total company. So, if you take any of these big companies like Maruti, it has a president, a CEO, board of advisors, board of directors and also for each unit there is a general manager and so on. So, basically there is an organization structure that that is associated with this. So, what about the modular organizations here? So, if you look at the electronic industry, the, in earlier we have vertically integrated computer companies like IBM, uh, 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 Sperry Univac, Wang and DEC and so on. These are all the companies which were vertically integrated and they have their own operating system, they make their own chips, they have their own computer design and they have their computer assemblies. Now, this kind of organization in the electronics which is vertically integrated has now changed it to vertically specialized computer industry which means that operating system is Windows, Mac, Unix, Linux and the, the chips are Intel, Samsung, Texas Instruments and others and you have computer design Dell, HP, IBM and so on or Lenovo and computer assembly, Solitronics, uh, Flexitronics and SEI and so on. So, it is all done by the contract manufacturers here. So, what happened by a single company is now replaced by several of these companies here. So, what what, what has happened is the transformation of the organization. Here, if you have a single company which is vertically integrated, you have a CEO who is managing all the branches here, all the four managers and so on. But here, each of them, Windows is Microsoft, Intel is its own company making the chips, Dell is its own assembly, and Flexatronics is a contract manufacturer. All are 
not co-located. They are all basically in different parts of the world and they are independent. They are financed by different people. They have different stock exchanges and so on. So that is where you have the, the transformation of the organization into electronic from vertically integrated to basically vertically specialized industry and so on. So now you are basically having a modular organization structure because you are basically having uh, an organization structure which is not by authority but by collaboration. So the authority now is transformed into sort of soft collaboration into this. So let us look at it in the next slide. So if you look at any corporation, this is a nice slide from Business Week in 2006, the, the work processes in practically every big department in a corporation can be outsourced. You can outsource human resources, you can outsource engineering, testing, design of electronic chips and machinery and so on. You can outsource software development, tech support, website design to IT infrastructure. You can outsource analytics, market research, financial analysis and risk calculation. You can outsource customer care. You can outsource manufacturing, contract production, everything of electronic to this one. You can outsource finance and accounting. There are lots of finance uh, firms which do your accounting like PwC, Deloitte and, and others. And you can outsource logistics and procurement which does, which includes just in time shipping, parts purchasing and after sales repair. So if you have a corporation which is basically has all these things are outsourced, then what is that you do? You should have a capability to basically collaborate with all of them, see that your work is done. Uh, because if it is under one organization, then you have a governance strategy which is vertically integrated, which is the authority flows from top to bottom. But here authority is everywhere. Each one is basically an independent corporation. So you have to basically take all this and put them to and weave them into this one. So that's where the governance of a corporation, governance of a corporation which has lot of outsourcing here is an important issue that we are going to study in one of the lectures in the coming months. So if you have a modular organization design uh, designs, for example, modular Organization of product designs paves the way of similar modularization of organized designs, facilitating coordination of activity via an information structure rather than managerial authority or hierarchy. Now, what does this mean? You have a product, and what you did was in a stuff you designed the product as a set of modules. Now, each module is made by a different company. They are different unit. So if we have say a 10 modules and each are done by 10 different companies and you have provide them the designs and you, the, the OEM or original equipment manufacturer gets these, these, these sub-assemblies and assembles them, right? So they are, what is the organization structure here? So each of these uh, modules production have units have their own CEOs, but the only thing that comes is what flows is the information. So that's where it comes to a collaboration structure, which is the information structure or an orchestration structure where you tell people what to do, when to deliver and uh, uh, what are the specifications, what are the designs and so on and collect it from them or ask some logistics provider to collect it and then deliver it to your assembly plant and you have to then assemble them. So the coordination of activities via an information structure rather than authority becomes an important thing and that becomes a modular organization structure. Design. Now what is codification of knowledge? That is whatever knowledge you have, it is not in the brains. You can write down as a piece of paper. 
it can be an algorithm or it can be uh, an expert system which is based on some some reasoning or it can be a machine learning algorithm. So, once you have all the knowledge and this is not in the brains of the people, but it is in the computer or it is in a form of an algorithm and it is standardization of the interfaces. That is when you have uh, assembled several products, the interfaces between the products and processes are standardized. Uh, separate stages of production, vertical specialization replace vertical integration. So, there are two factors which which basically made this outsourcing or vertical specialization uh, 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 possible and one of them is the standardization, another one is the codification of knowledge and standardization of the interfaces. And finally, codification together with stayed interface standards and design rules reduces the volume of information. So, if you have huge volumes of information that needs to be this one. Uh, to be transmitted to each other, then it becomes difficult. Though, but the knowledge sharing that is required for inter-firm co uh, coordination, or this one, is is a sort of minimal. It's uh, because you have basically some kind of a decision support system can handle the collaboration between uh, between organizations. So that is the modular organization structure that uh, we have here. So, in terms of uh, the conclusions of this particular, uh, this one on global supply chains, the production has moved from integrated manufacturing to distributed manufacturing and codification of knowledge, standardization of processes and the inter-organizational interfaces have boosted the vertical specialization. And this has provided impetus to the growth of contract manufacturing firms and outsourcing. So, what uh, uh, we will do? Uh, uh, next is to look at the delivery service uh, mechanisms. So, now uh, we will look at the second element of uh, the supply chain ecosystem which is the resources. So, the resources are uh, an important element of the ecosystem and uh, uh, that is what we are going to look at now. Now, the, uh, the in this uh, brief uh, presentation, we are going to look at the types of resources and the industrial resources like uh, special economic zones, industrial clusters and so on and conclude uh, this presentation. So, the types of resources are uh, the classical uh, economics defines natural resources which are basically mines, uh, water uh, 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 and so on and the human resources, they are basically both the uh, educated as well as the, the labor, the white collar, blue collar uh, labor resources and nowadays uh, the labor becomes very important uh, in the sense they have to be technology enabled. In other words, sometimes the technologies like automation uh, replaces the human resources, but the human resources may be needed to enable the technologies uh, like uh, uh, the computers, internet and so on. Internet gives you the connection, but you require humans to connect. So, this human resources and the, the interactions or interfaces between the humans and the, and the computers or, or the machines becomes an important issue. And then the third one is the financial resources. Of course, when you are talking of companies which are either small scale or large scale, they require financial resources. Financial resources as a part of the loans or they are a part of uh, you know to invest in their companies or as a part of uh, the operational expenditure for letters of credit or uh, for taking the loans for their customers and so on. So, and then you have the capital assets which are like machinery, warehouses, trucks and so on. These capital assets are one time expenditure, but their maintenance uh, and also the interest you have to pay, they become the operating expenditures. The, the modern view of course, in, the, in terms of the resources, it includes knowledge and intellectual property as the resource. So, if you have uh, people 
or your employees who create intellectual property which you can patent and that generates money for uh, these companies in R&D organizations as well as in institutions which concentrate on uh, 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 on, on R&D. Uh, the intellectual property becomes important. There is also a social capital or relationship with stakeholders. It's not enough just to have your company, but you have to have relationships with your stakeholders. Because you, if you are a globally dispersed company, if you are spread all over the globe, then it becomes uh, important to have a good relationship with people. And also management of high value delivery processes is the management like we said in the first lecture, like STEM uh, becomes an issue when it is globally dispersed and all the high value delivery processes have to be carefully managed. There is a, if you look at uh, uh, the resource landscape, there is a change. Last century, what happened were the prices of all natural resources like energy, food, water, oil, and the materials like steel all fell. They came down very heavily, that's because a uh, use of technology. But if you look at the past 10 years, they have wiped out all the price declines that have occurred over a century. The prices have started increasing, the food prices, oil prices, and energy became scarce and so on. So one has to be careful in terms of for the resources. Today demand is soaring because the population has increased, the countries, the uh, the, the emerging markets are industrializing, so with the more automation, more uh, uh, industry expansions, it becomes uh, the, the, the resources like oil, energy, water, they have become very important. New sources are scarce and extractions are imp uh, expensive. So shortage of one resource rapidly uh, impacts others. Supposing you have water, uh, water uh, is the bore wells if you want to have water which you want to uh, the groundwater table is declining so to bring it up you require more power. If you want to pump water from rivers to uh, the water tanks in the cities then you require power. So the shortage of one resource basically impacts rapidly the others. So the world could be entering into the area of high volatile resource prices. So, but people may think that like we have solved all the problems earlier, we will solve this problem also. It, it is possible that there is a lot of uncertainty in terms of finding the solution. So let's look at some of the uh, resources that uh, uh, the industrial resources. One are this what are called special economic zones. The SHGs are geographical region that has uh, economic class different from the rest of the country. In other words, it's a region where uh, all the uh, resources are provided, and all the it is a cluster where all the uh, industry stakeholders are also present. The power, water, there is no scarcity, even the rest of the country may have scarcity. And it has basically some tax incentives, tax shops. So some regions where you can manufacture, you have to necessarily export. In some other regions, you can also sell inside the country at a price. So basically, these are regions which, uh, uh, which have economic class which are different from uh, the other country. The goal of most of these special economic zones is to attract foreign investments. This is, for example, China has lots of um, uh, uh, special economic zones which uh, have been very successful. For example, they are established in China, India, Jordan, Poland, Philippines, Russia, North Korea, and several other countries. Indian SHGs are not as effective as those in China, probably because they are not focused. But uh, one of the very successful uh, SHGs in India are the IT SHGs, where uh, there, there, are, there are electronic cities which were built in cities like Pune, Bangalore, and Chennai, and in Hyderabad, and so on, where these SHGs will concentrate on the uh, 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 on the IT industry. 
But of course, there are the clusters, um, the industrial clusters which uh, come in. The industrial clusters are geographical concentrations of interconnected companies. So you have specialized suppliers, you have service providers and associated institutions like universities, training institutions in a particular vertical. If you have a, a cluster, say auto, then you have all the auto component people and the logistics providers who will provide uh, the, the trucks to transport the, uh, the components from the supplier to the manufacturer and so on. And also you have training institutes um, uh, in particular this one and also close by it may not be necessarily in the cluster but you have close by universities where research is being done for that particular vertical. And the proximity of companies and the institutions in one location fosters better coordination and trust, lowering the transaction costs, minimizing the inventory, importing, importing costs and delays. So if everybody is at one place, then of course you do not have the delivery costs. Delivery costs become minimal. So the coordination cost also because uh, you need not have to have a coordinator, people can deal directly with the other companies and that is where you will, you will minimize the coordination costs that are involved. So if you are basically sourcing from a cluster which is nearby, then you can follow just in time philosophy you can your trans transport costs are minimal, your inventory costs are minimal and also your coordination costs are minimal. So that is where the clusters are suggested by as one of the uh, things, one of the uh, innovations in, in the supply chains. And clusters allow companies to operate more productively in sourcing inputs because uh, you know the clusters are nearby so they can transfer knowledge information as well as the employees and it can accessing information technology and human resources so human resources also becomes uh, very easy so this is where we have uh, these these clusters there are several examples of these clusters one of the examples of uh, the clusters is the California wild cluster which is this is taken by uh, from Potter's book um, and so on. So, but you can see that uh, the diagram here uh, which is you have wine yards, uh, you have wine reprocessing facilities that is the in terms of the supply chain and also you have the, uh, the educational and research and trade that is the the educational resources, you have the institutions here which are the state government agencies and you have uh, the equipment, the barrels, bottles, caps and corks, labels, uh, public relations and advertising and, and so on. So if you take all this, di what are the elements of all this diagram, you can rearrange them into the supply chain, the institutions. And then, and the resources and the delivery mechanisms here. So you can see that the California is now a significant player in the wine industry, challenging Italy, France, and other European countries. So I mean, the one of the important things here to recognize is that the people have this cluster has become very famous and efficient and has become a, a cited as an example of a, of a cluster and you can see that the ecosystem framework is embedded in this cluster. You have not only the supply chain, the government rules, so you have educational institutions and so on. So everything is, is there in this. And University of California Def, uh, Davis which is the educational institute which is associated and this wine growers, they will have chaired professorships in this university and they help with lot of uh, um, uh, uh, innovations that are needed like mechanical harvesting, drip irrigation and field crafting. So the other kind of uh, clusters that we have is uh, the clusters in India which is India is now nowadays is called a small car hub. And if you take India is a large country with 28 states, but you will find the auto clusters are located in east, west, north and south. In the south it is Chennai or Madras, it is in the, in the north it is Delhi, in the west it is Calcutta and in the, 
in the west it is the pune bombay region you can find in this diagram all the uh, the state names where they are located you have uh, some uh, exceptions to this where in in the in the, uh, in the state of madhya pradesh you have uh, some clusters but most of these clusters are in indian uh, are in manesar in north which is near delhi pune in west which is near bombay and chennai in south and Jamshedpur, Calcutta in the east and Indore is the central India. Indore has, has become, has some hub and so on. So, the location advantage of, uh, has such as infrastructure, access to pool, education force and supportive state government policies are some of the factors that play a role in attracting auto investments here. So, why is India is now is called a small car hub? But that's because of several innovations like Tata Nano and Hyundai has made a small car and so on. So you have a lot of supportive environment for making India a small hub and in terms of these clusters. So the whole, uh, mm, uh, uh, all the manufacturing in India is uh, is concentrated in four places. So, I mean it depends that if uh, somebody who is located in Delhi in this region has to sell <coughs> basically to uh, to somebody in south, then you have to transport those, uh, uh, those cars uh, in special vehicles to the dealers in the south. So, there is a transport cost that is that is involved, but I think that's usually done. Similarly, if there is a car manufacturer in the south and if he wants to sell in the north, then the finished products, the automobiles, have to be uh, have to transit from south to north. And similarly, this happens from from west uh, to east or north or or south. So. This is the, but there is the, this cluster advantage of this. So, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, kind of things that are happening in the resource area, arena, one thing one has to be extremely careful uh, is the resources are getting scarce, particularly the uh, natural resources. The, if you look at the mines, the oil is getting scarce and the, uh, the others, aluminum, copper, and iron, this or the uh, the mining is becoming expensive, and the food, which is the agriculture, that is also becoming expensive, which is becoming, which is leading to the the inflation. Another factor that one need to uh, observe is when you are get, uh, resources are getting scarce or they are becoming expensive, it is important to have improve the efficiency of these resources. Now. In countries, it becomes uh, uh, once you make a resource efficiency, then of course it leads to some of the problems like jobless growth and so on. But it is important to improve the efficiency in all three sectors of the economy. In other words, in agriculture, where you use less water, less power, and uh, you know improve your uh, your fertility of the land and so on. In the manufacturing, you improve your labor productivity use less power, you try to change the processes so that you use less natural resources. And in services, of course, where which is IT and others, then you have to basically, it's a highly power intensive and one has to need to carefully this one. So, in my view, the next uh, decade will have to concentrate on not resource exploration, but resource efficiency.